afternoon, and welcome the launch of the Opioid Advocacy Stewardship and the Chief Training Clinical Care Center. I'm Anne Duggan, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality of Care. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this webcast from the land of the Aboriginal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and I know we're joined today by people from all over Australia, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the very land on which you work, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are participating in this session. We're delighted to be launching the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Australian Clinical Care Center today. And we had some great panel who have joined you today. Things we'll be discussing are best practices for those who are going to visit foreign surgery and in the medical side for patients without medical training and why this new standard is so important. But first, I have a short presentation on the Aboriginal Health. Opioid analgesics have established efficacy for managing acute pain, but as high risk medicines, they can cause unintended harm. One of those harms the risk of short-term opioid use becoming a long-term problem. This risk is often not recognised in this setting. So the goal of the standard is not to prohibit access to opioid analgesics, but to make sure that they're used appropriately. Managing pain is clearly very important. It's a question of how we do that. Why is appropriate use important? Because inappropriate use can lead to long-term use, tolerance, and sometimes addiction. It can ruin lives. This is a quote from a young person who is prescribed an opioid analgesic as part of their treatment for a simple sports injury while they still have That prescription led to persistent use and many, many harms. As the person said, I was given a prescription it lasted a lot longer than the pain itself. With own, within only a few months, I was addicted. I lost everything. I quit school, stopped playing sports, and I started to watch my life slip away. Tragically, this is not an isolated situation. In 2018, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare produced a comprehensive report on opioid use and harm in Australia. It found that 3.1 million people had one or more prescriptions dispensed for opioids in the 2016-17 year. And about 715,000 used opioid analgesics for use at all non-medical purposes. So while some of those harms occur in the community setting, the acute care setting is a key area of risk for initiating which can transition into prolonged, persistent and harmful use. And that's why the standard we are launching today is focused on the use of opioid analgesics in that acute setting, particularly emergency departments and foreign surgery. It is important to note that we're not talking about use of opioid analgesics for chronic pain or for major pain. One Australian study published in 2019 found that initiating opioid analgesics after surgery leads to ongoing use in around 4% of people. While this is a relatively small proportion, given the frequency of surgical procedures, a large number of people in the community may be affected. And this is a modest, modest section of other studies have found higher rates. Some of the harms of opioid analgesics include immediate adverse effects, such as somnolence, constipation, nausea, Spiritual depression. Other harms develop over longer term with persistent use. These can include dependence, poor quality of life, unintended overdose, and in some cases, death. And this problem has broader social harms too. Extra medical use is often increased costs to the health system, loss of productivity in the workplace, crime, and road traffic accidents. And then we can also talk about the harm done to those around the people who are dependent particularly in the context of mental health. The parents, the partners, the children. So let's return to this young person. From her perspective, she says, I do look at those eight years of really wasted years. 
wife of my son, John Maria Taylor. When we're prescribing for acute pain, this is not the outcome any clinician would expect, but it happens. And the third Australian Atlas of Healthcare Variation found that between 2014 and 2017, the rate of opioid analgesic dispensing per 100,000 people increased by 5%. There is a need for careful assessment and management to deliver the benefits of opioid analgesics without increasing the possibility of harm. So the purpose of this clinical care standard is to provide clinicians with clear information to help them make decisions about appropriate care, to provide health service organisations with guidance on systems that enable them to review their processes and make improvements when they can, and to inform patients about the care they should be able to access and give them the information they need to make informed treatment decisions in partnership with their community. The expert advisory group that worked on this standard included expertise in pain medicine, emergency medicine, orthopedic and neurological surgery, addiction medicine, emergency and perioperative medicine, hospital pharmacy, and community pharmacy, research, general practice, and consumer. The reason I mention this is that opioid analgesic stewardship is a shared responsibility. It runs across surgery, post-operative care, clinical pharmacy, community pharmacy, general practice, and local health care. It runs across junior and senior partners. The clinical care standard requires that all of us reflect on how we use analgesics, modifying our reflection to ensure appropriate use of opioid relief pain and improved function, and align our actions with the evidence-based recommendations of the Opioid Analgesic Stewardship and Acute Pain Analgesic Standard. The clinical care standards include nine quality statements. The statements are accompanied by indicators to help services monitor their care and their quality improvement. The first two statements relate to the way we communicate with patients. You need to talk to patients about what they can expect during recovery, what may not, which may not be the complete absence of pain, but a gradual return to useful function. You need to explain the options and consider opioid sparing analgesic strategies and non pharmaceutical ways of relieving pain. Understanding when a patient is in pain is important. But we should not rely on self-reported pain scales alone, nor should opioids be prescribed according to pain alone. Assessing the impact of pain on function is an important process. Statement five is about appropriate and analgesic prescribing. I said before the standard is not aimed to prevent opioid prescribing, but to ensure a this means using the immediate release formulation, which can be better tailored to response and adverse effects and modify them. Using appropriate doses and duration for therapy, knowing that response to treatment can be checked. Being clear in our prescribing about the intended duration of therapy to avoid unnecessary repeat prescriptions. And most importantly, having a plan which is discussed with the patient about how they expect to stop the opioid analgesia. The final two statements are focused on the importance of tailoring the treatment that suits the patient, their circumstances, and their needs. While the patient's in hospital, regular review of therapy allows us to ensure the opioid is working and to adjust those or treatment according to need. Alternative therapy or taking steps to seek opioids might need to be considered. And when the patient's discharged back to the community, adequate communication with the patient and their GP about the plan for these medicines is essential. As clinical care standards, we are asking that we take up opioid analgesic stewardship as a shared responsibility. This may look different in different health services, but something we can all do is reflect on our use of opioids, modify our research behaviours, align our actions with the evidence-based recommendations of the OAS. Thank you. Thank you.
And of course, the clinical care standards and many other resources are available in the clinical And now, I'd like to introduce to you to our panel who are here to help us introduce the standards. First up, I'm pleased to welcome Content Associate Professor Jennifer Tilden. Jennifer is an anaesthetist and pain medicine specialist who works in both private and public hospitals within the Sydney St. Vincent Hospital in New South Wales. Her private practice includes orthopedic, geriatric, and gynecology surgery. Jennifer's research publications include perioperative anesthesia and opioid abuse. She's also past recipient of the New South Wales Health Award for Collaborative Leader of the Year. Welcome, Jennifer. The next member of our panel is Dr. Andrew Stetson. Andrew is an orthopedic surgeon specialising in trauma and hip and knee preservation, salvage and aftercare. He works in a hybrid practice of urban and rural care between Sydney and central western South Wales. Andrew holds fellowships in the Australian Orthopedic Association and the Royal Australian College of Surgeons and has a passion for surgical preservation. And next we're joined by Swee Wu. Swee has worked in both community and hospital settings in Australia and the US. She's a pharmacy board examiner, guest lecturer at Monash University, and the inaugural chairperson of the Surgery and Perioperative Medicine Specialty Practice Team for the Society of Hospital Pharmacists in New South Wales. Swee has 15 years at Alfred Hospital. She has implemented new pharmacist roles in perioperative surgery and anaesthetic care. Welcome, Swee. Finally, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Hector Wilson. Hector is an addiction medicine specialist who's worked in primary health care setting for 25 years. Hester is undertaking a PhD focus in GPs and patients with prescription opioid use disorder and works in general practice in New South Sydney. She's chair of the Australian, Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, Prescription and Institute in Addiction Medicine and holds fellowships with the RACGP and Chapter of Addiction Medicine in the Royal Australian College of Physicians. Welcome, Hester. Andrew. Large numbers of Australian patients receive surgery in public and private hospitals each year and are prescribed opioid analgesics to manage patient anxiety. What can surgeons do to ensure a closer prescribing and use of opioid analgesics? I think that there are a number of uh, steps that surgeons can take to help with this situation. Preoperative education of the patient and uh, your surgical team to help them understand what to expect from pain and pain relief is very important and then as far as prescribing habits we need to be careful to try and avoid modified release opiates wherever possible and to adjust opiate doses um, to match the patient's functional pain and their activity that they're able to do as closely as possible. And to remember that those adjustments we make need to be able to continue after the patient is discharged from hospital. And then one of the things that the standards are very clear on is the importance of communication on patient transitions. So as the patient is discharging from hospital, it's important to remember that they're not discharged from your care and that the surgery that you've done and the pain the patient has follows them out of a hospital and that it's uh, important to communicate with the patient's treating team, such as their general practitioner, what to expect from pain and how to manage it. Important aspect of prescribing analgesia is to make sure we manage risk of prescribing opiates. And part of that is to use the lowest doses that are reasonable to control the patient's pain. And then the evidence is increasing that we really should try and avoid modified release or slow release opiates wherever possible. So there's, there's a number of issues involved with it. One of them is it there's an unpredictable um, high risk of uh, respiratory compromise with using modified release and it doesn't necessarily fit to risk patterns that we can predict prior. The other issue that we have is it's quite difficult to titrate those doses quickly and adequately like we can with immediate release. 
and we can't match the patient's functional needs, such as they're about to get up with physiotherapy. So there can be many problems with titrating, slow release or modified release opiates. And a lot of these problems are solved by using immediate release opiates. When patients are discharged from hospital or leave the emergency department, what does the general practice practitioner look for in the information provided? Discharging from hospital care to community care is incredibly important and that safe transfer of care is core to that. So for us as GPs, we do need to have that discharge summary with information about what's happened in hospital and what the plan is going forward. And in particular, the plan for um, post-discharge medications. How long? What dose? What medications to help us have those discussions with our patients? And we need that in a timely manner, ideally before the patient arrives. Uh, you know, many patients will be able to bring along the discharge summary with them, but it is really fantastic as a GP to have that information beforehand. You know your patient is coming in. You can have reviewed the notes beforehand. Uh, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, talking to patients around this, involving them in the transfer of care. So make an appointment to see your GP to follow up. We will have sent a discharge summary. Here's a copy for you uh, that explains in detail what the plan is to help you through your recovery, uh, you know, as you, as you move, move forward. And this is the same if it's, say, an inpatient admission in a public or a private hospital, if it's a day stay, if it is um, an, an emergency department visit. For us as GPs, having that information so that we know exactly what is required, how many days, what dose, what the plan is, is really important. And then if the patient comes to us and says that the um, it's not working, I need more, then we as GPs know something else is going on here. We do need to look more deeply at this uh, and make sure that there's not some kind of complication that they don't need to be seen by their surgeon again. There isn't more action that needs to be taken. So if I can pick up with you, Jennifer, you're working in a big specialist hospital, lots of surgery goes on. Uh, what do you see as the major contribution that you've made to changing surgeries approach to opioid Thanks. And uh, look, I think that um, even as an anaesthetist, I have to admit that surgeons have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And they have power, I think, um, mainly with patients. You know, if you go along to see a surgeon um, and you're about to put your, your life in their hands, your joint, your back, whatever, I listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really about engaging the surgeons, getting them on board, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, it's, I think, almost impossible to run a good opioid stewardship program without their engagement. And uh, they're very educable. <laughs> And, uh, exactly. Um, you know, they're an intelligent group who want the best for their patients. And so I think that's a really fantastic place to start. Um, so the things that we try to get them to do is to, um, to do more planning with their patients, to make sure that their patients hopefully are not on opioids as they come into their surgery. And to be really supporting GPs in that when they're messaging through their direct contact with the patient, but also in their letters to the GP. So I think that's really crucial is to use them as a conduit both to GPs and patients. If you could only do a sound bite of interest, what would be the one thing you'd have to do? And what would be a sort of any sort of thing to take it away from the patient? I had a specific book for something to do with medical research. Ah, I think you'd be surprised. I think it's more about outcomes. You know, that's what's important to the patient. Mm -hmm. And it's also what is important to the team who's working with the patient. And you want that patient to have a good outcome. All right? So as soon as you can show that the patients who come in on opioids before their operation, the patients who have higher doses during their perioperative period, without the use of local anesthetic, without the use of um, adjuncts such as the simple analgesics. 
um, patients who go home with no sort of real understanding of the nuances around opioids, no real understanding of how they have to use them properly and when they should be coming off them, those patients have worse outcomes. And I think once you can get that message across to your surgeons, you've got them. Mm-hmm. Because that's what they want for their patients as well. So we're all on board with that, and I think that's the crux of what we need to use. Now, you're pretty also in the kids' physician hospital. Yes. Yeah. And you've done a lot of establishment of a framework around yeah. that you're actually working through. Mm-hmm. From your perspective, um, what do you see as the most important aspect of healthcare? So, uh, so I've had a analgesic stewardship program and anti cancer medicine uh, over five years now at the hospital I work in, which is Alfred Health in Victoria. Uh, one of the key components I see is um, the structure and the governance around the program. So we've got a multidisciplinary committee that involves nursing, medical, and pharmacy staff in the areas that prescribe a lot of opioid analgesics. And our focus has been across the, all the analgesics, not just the opioids. Um, and I think having that uh, collaborative, multidisciplinary committee, which then reports back to hospital exec, um, gives it that um, importance and relevance um, and impetus to you know, make change within the hospital system. So Jennifer mentioned, and I know you talk more than surgeons, uh, you mentioned senior doctors and nurses. Can you tell us a bit about their, what you see as their role? I think they're very pivotal to the whole program and to not just the program, but effective and safe use of all analgesics. Um, so I think it's about um, engaging them, um, learning you know, what what their day is like, how do we impact uh, without adding more burden to their workflow. Um, and it's about Presenting that data, I found data is really helpful. Um, we, when we presented prescribing data in different areas, for example, the surgical or the ED setting, people are surprised and it helps them reflect on their practice. And I think that's one way to really engage is to have that data and then work with them to how do you fit that, let's say, academic detailing or education into their day to day practice. It's certainly better than when Young the agents in the newspaper, and the framework to support it. C1D1 C1 is almost a case study, it's got a lot of things to access to. As you say, that's the third thing. You also mentioned nursing staff. They play a pivotal role. So, really, I'm going to go to the patient advocate for this, which is somewhat more similar to that raising. So, do you have a Part of your program is involving influencing nurses and then engaging them in the more perspective. So as part of the multidisciplinary um, stewardship committee, we have uh, a couple of nurses who sit on the committee. Um, so they do a lot of the education and um, uh, advocating for you know, the importance of nursing role within analgesic stewardship or effective use of analgesic. Um, so they're the pain nurses and some of the, we have a trauma a uh, clinical nurse educator who helps us spread the message and encourage um, appropriate use of analgesics. So, if you're into, you know, ensuring pain assessment is you know, documented regularly, bowel assessment, monitoring for side effects, um, you know, respiratory rate. Um, and also, and I think at a lot of hospitals, nurses are you know, the person that the patient sees the most and has the greatest influence on their care. So I think that's why it's very important to engage the nursing staff, who are actually often the ones potentially influencing prescribing, but also administering and educating the patient. So tell us a bit, for five years, you know, talking to some of them, but can you tell us about some of the things that are some of the great successes that you really have made them very positive? So I would say that, um, you know, seeing clinicians, uh, think about their prescribing practices. So not just around the opioids, but the whole um, focus, which is around improving function, getting patients to get up and do things, getting them home, um, and not just focusing only on opioids, but the whole you know, functional assessment scores, 
to um, rather than just the speed that they do with themselves. Um, we've been able to reduce the amount of slow release opioids used in opioid naive surgical patients because um, we know not all surgical patients need slow release opioids. Um, with along that same vein, we've been able to reduce side effects from that burden of opioids, so constipation, um, nausea and vomiting, um, things that often are less sexy but mm -hmm. are important to the patient. In addition, we've increased um, communication to the GP. So we've put in a lot more weaning plans around the analgesics um, and really the collaborative work to promote the process of the care. And how can we do that? I think we really was out there to the uh, weaning program to speak. I just want to pick up on that issue about modified release. It's been an issue. We know all about that. As much as far as I'll give you a go. So, what, what's your view about the modified release of opioids? What's your view? Yeah, so I think this has been one of the more controversial parts of the clinical care mm -hmm. standard. And um, what we're really using is the idea that the patient needs to be as much in control as possible. So if you look at a patient who's recovering from surgery, when they're lying in bed, they won't have a lot of pain, but then they will be able to get up and go to the toilet or do their physiotherapy, walk around the ward. Or if they're at home, they might want to make themselves a cup of tea. So as much as possible, you need to be able to match those periods of increased activity and pain with the opioid. So the idea is that you use the simple analgesics as your background, and then you use the opioid as immediate release under the control of the patient as much as possible to match those times of increased pain. And what that does, as we was saying, is just to reduce the overall number of milligrams of opioid, which then reduces the side effects while still getting the same uh, result. So you're getting more bang for your opioid butt, essentially. Um, in terms of um, side effects, uh, what do you think has been really big um, problem, probably underneath it, to get them ready to experience? I mean, what, what's the, the thing that, you, if you had to sort of have a discussion with somebody who didn't quite understand the issue, what, what do you reckon is what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night? In the hospital setting. Do you know what? It's not so much about keeping me awake, it's about making my job easy mm -hmm. and making it easy for the GPs, for the nurses, for the pharmacists, and most importantly for the patients. And so I live in a little bit of what I call a post slow release world. Mm -hmm. So in our hospital, very little slow release gets prescribed mm -hmm. unless the patient's already on it in a completely different case entirely. But in that world, life is a lot easier. So we don't have the same level of side effects. The patients are not quite as focused on their medication. You're not causing, I think, as much hyperalgesia along the way. And then it's just uh, the workload is less. It's easier to get patient satisfaction. So I think that um, I know that there were a lot of questions came in about you know how we're going to manage the workload related to all of the audits and all of this sort of thing. I think what people don't realise is that if you can eliminate a lot of the slow release, both in patients who are coming into the hospital and newly prescribed, that you actually make your workload lighter. And we've really noticed that in our hospital. It's, it's very noticeable. <laughs> What's your perception of patient feedback? So, I think there has been this massive shift that I've noticed in the last sort of eight to ten years with patients, as I said, sort of understand the nuances more mm -hmm. of opioids. So it used to be just opioids are painkillers, and they are the gold standard, and the more you have, the better your pain relief is. 
And it's a much more nuanced discussion than that. And I think patients are beginning to really understand that. They see the good side, they see the bad side. And I think we need to help reinforce all of that and to do it in a really consistent way so the patient is getting a similar message all the way through. So I think that's kind of been the biggest change that I've seen from the patient's point of view is just having a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of what opioids can and can't do. That'd be great. Getting your doctor to touch them again. Because that's always very important. Yeah, it's seeing the benefits from the patient before you do that. That's what you're doing. What about your experience in Melbourne? Can you change that from the human? So we did a study last year. It was um published at the moment, um, but we looked at patient satisfaction, did they follow our anesthesia plan post-discharge, um, and overall the majority were very satisfied with their anesthesia plan that we provided them. They actually followed the multimodal anesthesia regimen, um, and actually we had a small percentage only that was still on opioids at some point compared to other studies out there. Uh, so overall patients are mostly satisfied. There's still a little bit of work to do with some of the patients, and that's the bit that we need to dissect and mm-hmm. see where are the other areas that we can improve. Forward with that, yeah. See if we can link it to our website. Yeah. So we can let people think, um, use your survey tool at least. Yeah. To to that. Now, you mentioned you talked about the, the, the discharge plan. Mm-hmm. Can you just tell me what's changed over five years in terms of the discharge plan? Yeah. So we had a, we knew that you know, primary communication GP was an area that our hospital could improve on. So that was already something that was being done prior to our stewardship committee being formed and the program being formed. The layer that we added on as the committee was the detail around it. So you know, why are they on this anesthetic? How long are we expecting patients to be on it for? What is the you know, weaning regimen? So if you're being sent on an opioid, and anti-inflammatory paracetamol. How do you take it? How much? When do you stop it? Um, and you know, how do you take that here in the us and taught patients? Don't necessarily understand patient or patient. Mm-hmm. Um, and then an indication to the GP that for inclusion into the discharge summary, all those details, including um, to the quantity supplied. So at least the GP has an indication of how much supply the patient is. So as much detail as possible to help the GP. Have you had feedback from the GP as to whether they think we can wait? Um, we haven't done that study. That is in the pipeline. Just give it a Because it's true, we often do things, but what is the impact to the GP? Yeah, but we haven't had negative feedback. Uh, because the, um, of course, the guest is not online, but yeah. we had that chat. Yeah. Because I said, well, I'm a big GP, and they were stuck in. This is really very, very busy. Yeah. It's quite late in terms of get the discharge done on time. So I've checked out that information. It should be provided. Yeah. So it's great because we have a GP liaison clinician on our committee, and she actually was the one who said, no, we want those details. GPs appreciate and want that detail. What do you, how long do you want that patient to be in for? Short term, long term? Yeah. So that's why we added that into our discharge summary. I think we've been particularly bad at that in the private sector as well. So um, one of the things that I realised is such a simple thing to do is just say pro forma that has paracetamol, uh, anti-inflammatory, opioid, how long you expect it to be on, please dispose of this medication. Just as a simple form that as the anaesthetist, you know, you can just fill in the numbers or the particular drugs and hand it to the patient and also say, please take this to your GP the first time you go so that the GP knows the same information that the patient's getting, the surgeon sees it the patient's notes while they go through the process. So everybody sees that same information and it's so quick to fill those things out. And I think there's a few of those forms that have been put on the internet that people can use if they like to. I know the Opioid Stewardship Working Party in Brisbane, they've got a form that for me is a little complicated. Ours is much more simple than that. But, um, you know, just 
very straightforward information that the patient can go back to and take the edge of the What's your take on this? We've got to be this. So much to talk about this. I guess I would like to reinforce the use of the word inappropriate. So, in the standard, it talks about inappropriate opioid dosing. And I just want to make that clear that that's not just about inappropriate over dosing, it's also about inappropriate under dosing. So, I think there's a lot of um, work to be done in groups of patients who come into hospital on opioids, whether it be uh, for chronic pain or opioid agonist therapy, and not underdosing them, restricting access, stigmatizing them. I think that's very important. And also an understanding that if you're 30, then half an endone for severe pain is just not going to cut it. So we need to be able to individualize dosing. We need to be able to educate patients so that they understand the complexities of the risks and benefits of opioids. Um, so I think those things are, you know, very, very, very important. important. And really, we just shouldn't be using this clinical care standard to just restrict access when opioids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, when, you know, opioids are still a vital part of pain relief. And please. Uh, so mine would really be around, I know a lot of the discussion and the clinical care standards is around opioid analgesics, but I would say we would need to look at how we use all of the analgesics for exactly the same reason as Vinny said, so that we don't underdo our patients or overdo the patients with the safety side. Um, and I think that everyone can implement elements of this clinical care standard as soon as you too much step away from this meeting. Um, so you can start small at an individual level or a team level, and then you know as time grows, um, you know you go to a program organisational level with the support from your executive you know, committee to introduce a whole program that looks across the whole hospital. But I think the clinical care standard will provide you with that framework and guidance around how you can implement analgesic or opioid stewardship in your daily life. I think the exciting and important aspects of the standard is that it really highlights the importance of transition of the patient through the hospital system, particularly uh, when patients are discharged from hospital. It's important that surgeons are communicating with their treating team, usually their general practitioner. Uh, what the intended doses are on discharge, what the plan would be to step down uh, those medications, and when it might be that the patient's stepping outside of what we expect. So if they've got increasing pain, it could be a sign of a problem and that might need to be communicated back to the surgical team. Key take-home message from us as GPs is give us information in a timely manner so that we can support our patients through that post-operative period. The right amount of opioids that need to, be, need to be prescribed, what other treatments need to be prescribed to support that and ensure a good outcome for our patients. While opioids have been used to treat pain for millennia, the rise of powerful synthetic opioids in recent decades has added new dimensions to their clinical use as well as new risks of harm. Recent evidence has shifted our thinking in terms of what is regarded as best practice in opioid prescribing. And in response, the regulatory environment has been changing to reduce potential harms and to reflect this new evidence base. The TTA has been playing a role in helping health workers and consumers adapt to new ways of utilising opioids through regulatory reforms combined with extensive communication and education activities. Our funding of the Australian Commission on Quality and Safety in Healthcare to create this new opioid standard forms an important part of this work. We recognise that in relation to opioids, there is often a gap in the pathway of care between health facilities and care in the community. It has been all too common for people to be admitted to a health facility for surgery or acute treatment and to be discharged with a larger quantity of opioids 
than they needed for their acute pain and without a clear pathway to taper them or an effective handover for treatment in the community setting. Weeks or months down the track, patients have found that they unwittingly have become dependent on opioids, compounding their health issues. This new standard will help to fill that gap in the pathway of care. It will help to mitigate the risks of unsafe opioid use throughout the system while still ensuring patients have access to pain relief when they need it. With this standard in place, we can all hope that Australia continues making progress towards ensuring patients have access to safe and effective pain management. As Chair of the Board of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I'm very pleased to officially launch the Opioid Analgesic Stewardship in Acute Pain Clinical Care Standard. In 2019, the Therapeutic Goods Administration commenced a series of regulatory reforms related to opioid analgesics. The changes ensure the safe and effective prescription and use of opioids while maintaining appropriate access for patients who need them. The new national standard developed by the Commission targets appropriate prescribing of opioid analgesics for acute pain in order to avoid short-term use becoming a long-term problem. More than 2.5 million people undergo surgery in public and private hospitals every year. Even if only 4% become persistent users of opioid medicines, this equates to 100,000 people per year. We have a significant opportunity to reduce opioid-related harm. As a healthcare community, it is vital that we reflect on our use of opioid analgesics to treat acute pain in the hospital setting, both in emergency department and for patients post-operatively. I would like to thank all the clinicians and consumers who have contributed to the development of this important standard, especially our panel members. Their expertise and experience have been invaluable. I hope that you have enjoyed this webcast and find the resources valuable. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much for your time today. Go and look at the uh, standards, see what you can do to make a difference and improve your patient's